Okay, uh, welcome uh, to the uh, inaugural session of the colloquium for 2016. Uh, nice to see so many familiar faces and some uh, new faces that I hope uh, become familiar. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, to kick things off with, uh, with David uh, Samuels. This is um, work that really follows up on his book with Cambridge in 2014 on inequality and democratization. Uh, David's been at uh, University of Minnesota, as far as I can tell, his whole career, right? So 17 years. Um, I've never been able to stay the place that long. Um, so something I can use. Uh, but he's he's he is truly one of the uh, leading people in political science working in, in comparative. Uh, and in particular, he's done an uh, incredible, substantial amount of work on Latin America. And uh, people like himself, and perhaps not only like himself, I'm the best. But so this is, uh, I see it as uh, mature scholars do, branching out into a bigger, bigger picture. Uh, this is one of the most longstanding issues in political science about uh, democracy. So, David, thanks. Well, thanks to Lee uh, for inviting me. Uh, I guess I have four minutes and fifty seconds left now, <laughs> so I should cut to the chase. Uh, I really, I really do appreciate this kind of opportunity uh, to to come and instead of presenting, actually listen to more what you think. Um, but I'll say a few things. Uh, number one, that if it isn't obvious uh, that this paper is a something we could have but didn't include in the book. Uh, and it's, it's a direct extension of the logic of the book. Um, and we were asked to make the book smaller by several parties. So we did. <laughs> Some people can't hear you. So we, we were asked to make the book shorter. And so we did. And so this is the first effort to extend the, the logic since the, the question in the book was, where does democracy come from? This is now, well, how do you, once you get democracy, how do you keep it? And uh, if it's not clear also from the paper that we're pretty explicitly trying to engage Adam Javorsky's famous answer to this question, which is uh, poor democracies die, rich democracies are immortal, and he even put a dollar figure on this. I think in current dollars it's $6,000 per capita income. And our response is, well, that's very nice, but we all know that the mean can obscure inequalities. And moreover, that, again, as in our book, it's not just inequality, it's inequalities. It's about the rural sector and the urban sector. Different kinds of assets can have different kinds of political consequences. And so the effort we're making is to try to keep it simple, stupid, which is if you have a very unequally distributed uh, set of resources in the rural sector, the per capita income you need to survive as a democracy is much higher than it is if sector the rural sector's resources are distributed relatively east equally. And uh, I'll admit that the uh, income inequality side of the story that we're working with is definitely what I want to hear more from you about because I'm Ben and I are still struggling with how to play out the logic of our argument once you get a democracy. And I'm actually thinking <laughs> that, that it's different from what's in the paper, but I want to hear what you think about about this story, so uh, that I can start working on this again. Obviously, we haven't worked on it since we presented it about five months ago, so it's time for us to start thinking about how to nail this down a little more solidly. Which is why an opportunity like this is great. So I'm just gonna shut up and uh, listen to you guys. Great. Why don't you t tell me who you are? Yes, that's good. It's also, uh, you're not all political scientists, right? right. So. Well, I actually am a political oh. scientist. <laughs> okay. Kirk Harris, I'm a PhD student here in the, in the department. Um, and I had a question about uh, the, um, the difference between sort of democracy and rule of law, because it seems like critical to your story is the idea that, um, uh, that, in demo that democracies um, can't sort of, uh, sort of willfully um, Extrajudicially expropriate uh, capital, um, and uh, um, 
typically when we measure democracy or democratization, you know, we're looking at the presence of elections, which is different than, um, than you know, the, this uh, sort of legal restraint on uh, whoever the sovereign is. Um, and so I was just wondering, kind of first of all, uh, what, uh, um, what implications do you think that has for, uh, for your argument? I mean, um, well, somewhere in the book we have the footnote, this footnote about whether democracies uh, expropriate uh, versus autocracies, and, and I, I think we just come down on, on the side of saying that you're, it's, it's a relative question, sure, but we're, we simplify it when we, this is a footnote, right? So yeah. in, the, in the text we're simplifying things, but in the footnote we say, yes, it's a relative question, but we'll just come down on the side of it's, it, it, it's uh, uh, fruitful to simplify and say democracies are much less likely than mm -hmm. autocracies. And then we cite that paper by Gelbach and Kiefer that says there are only three autocracies in modern history that have not expropriated the wealth. And, and since the time they published it, one of those democratized. And one of them is Singapore, which I don't really count as a country so much sometimes. So, so it's not, I forget what it was even, uh, what okay. the, the one remaining example was. So that's not a great answer, but it's a, I, I'll say it's a relative question. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that history supports that coming down on that side. Let me ask uh, uh, both a theoretical and an empirical question. You know, on. The, the theory behind this is um, you, you talk about redistribution and, and voting. And, and then for some of your empirical work, you've got 1820 to now. Uh, and not accidentally, a lot of countries uh, had property um, as a requirement for voting. Or Brazil had literacy. Or you had other things that uh, can proxy for um, certain types of wealth. And certainly, property is the best proxy for rural wealth. Uh, and then the empirical question is, one, what you do with that. And then also, except for a footnote, you don't spend a lot of time talking about family farms. And as one who spent a lot of time on that particular question, we have absolutely no idea in the United States the number of family farms. Because the census does not collect data on family farms. They collect data on operators. So that means every tenant is a farm operator, and wage laborers are not. Uh, that's important. It's important in most countries because tenants are about 50% of the population, farm population, uh, in OECD countries. And for some countries, historically, like Argentina, being a fixed rent tenant was a pretty secure deal in the, in the compass. And so there's sort of the property voting, and then how do we measure this thing, that I think is not given enough attention. So I, I have a question, is that your first point was, what are the implications for having property requirements? For well, voting? in other words, you throw everything in there, this, this family farm measure, but if people can't vote, and, and, and what you're afraid of, uh, if you go into a coup, right, you're saying, OK, ex post, uh, how am I going to get screwed? And the degree to which you're going to get screwed depends on voting, and voting depends on holding property. Uh, then in Britain and the US, when you had to have property, you're less likely to support. Uh, you're not as worried about yeah. an autocracy. I guess uh, indeed, you support democratization, which the rural sector did in the US um, historically. That's a good question. I mean, I, I kind of wonder now how many countries had property requirements circa, say, 1920 um, versus 1840. Um, most of the most of the analysis in the book and in the paper started in 1850, and yeah. so I think that's gone by the in the U.S. The the rates in Britain, for example, there's this debate about uh, what is a householder, and, and, you, and, and the, the historical debate is whether they were enforcing whether they were able to enforce this rule right. on householders, <clears throat> and I kind of punk on that. Um, I, I don't know how much that would really change things. And the reason, I, the reason I say is because uh, it has to do with the answer to the second question, uh, family farms. And, and there's some confusion about our use of this variable. Um, because 
that's just the numerator. Right. The denominator is the population of right. the rural sector. Now, are those, uh, is that great data? No. Neither are the Gini coefficients, right? But whenever I get asked this question, I, my response is, uh, which I got from Gary Cox, because Gary Cox was asked the same question about the quality of campaign finance data in Japan when he was doing some research on this. And he said, monkeys did not type these data. And that's what I said about, about the Gini coefficient data, is that they're not random. No, they may, I'm not trying to get point estimates, right? The patterns, you're not, like the example we use of China and the UK circa 1870, they're not going to be reversed, nor did they have the same levels of land and income inequality, right? They, these are real patterns in the data, and I think that when we take the family farms data divided by what we think are good estimates of rural population, you get a good proxy for the relative uh, concentration of power in the rural sector. Will, so it may be that rural tenants in a parts of Argentina had a pretty good deal, but the question for me is, overall, what was the relative balance of uh, large landowners versus huge numbers of peasants is that, in that's, the country? Well, that's the bottom line. I think right. you can get better measures on that than you probably have. I agree. By I've dealing seen so. with, with tenants, because there's, there's a lot of data across countries on <coughs> Tenancy. So it's just parsing it out. Yeah. You, you know, uh, economists take robustness over the top uh, at, uh, checks, but it would be I'll a nice from you. it would be a nice robustness check to um, to deal with tenant farmers. I have seen uh, Michael Bardis has a new paper. He's at the University of Chicago, and he's been gathered some some better data on levels of uh, rural inequality using uh, rural censuses. Better and. and he finds the same correlations we do. He has a different kind of argument, but in terms of rural inequality, he ends up with pretty much the same answer. So that was nice to see. Um, I haven't seen any data that go back that far for that many countries, though. That's right. the problem. Like, it's one thing to say, oh, we've got a census that goes for France in the 19th century, but uh, I don't know, maybe by the time I retire, someone will have done it. I don't know. Oh, maybe. I doubt it. I don't know. So. So, I guess this is a similar kind of question. You make some observations in the paper about the, short, the either the shortcomings of Gini coefficients or the shortcomings of the way we use Gini coefficients, and I'll let you talk through which it was. I want to ask you to think out loud more broadly with us then about in what ways our theorizing or our ability to theorize is limited by our measurements. And what would what would some better measures yeah. look like? <clears throat> yeah, Armando and I were just talking about this when, when you, you were talking about uh, uh, in, in the book and in the paper, you know, when you say all the actions in the top five to ten percent, right? And, and uh, a Gini coefficient, or even a top five to top bottom 50 ratio, doesn't help you. And, and, and I was saying, well, you know, if we have the deciles proportions, and then maybe the top ventile, the 95th percent, you can impute the top, you know, using a little bit of calculus, you impute the top 1%, 2%, right. but I don't know if that still gets us very far for, for, for at least two reasons. Number one, historically, the structure of wealth and income changes over time and across countries, right? So in 19th, in 19th century England, uh, what I love those, those social tables from Peter Linder, what it really shows you is the bourgeoisie is in the 98th <coughs> percentile. And even the petty bourgeoisie is, is it, it, it's extremely rich relative to the median voter. How much does that help you to go to the tenth of a percent within the top two or three percentile? I don't know. Uh, and, and number two is because at, also as you move forward in time with techno technological changes, even more the sources of wealth uh, that may have divergent political consequences come from different sources. You start getting into the resource curse literature. Well, is it oil wealth that, that matters? And at what percentile does this matter? Or other resources? Uh, is it human capital? Is, is it labor? Is it, it land? What does land even mean today in, in terms of wealth? Um, we were talking about the transformations in the countryside and, and, and how today that what uh, land owning has such a different political consequence than it does. Even in uh, less developed countries, Brazil, El Salvador, India, than it might have even just 50 years ago. So 
Uh, I agree with you, I think, in the principle that we, we still are, uh, and it, you were just saying we need to move on from this de debate. I was like, no, I don't think so in some ways, because we still, as social scientists, need to rethink what some of these indicators mean, because they, they mean different things across space and time. Uh, I think, though, what was inspiring your question initially was this uh, realization when I was, well, years ago, when I was first coming to this project, and I was thinking about Brazil, inspiring the project, and running some correlations using the Bourbon and Morrison data, and just really tearing my hair out. I said, why is he positively correlated with regime change? And I, and I realized, well, OK, it's because the front end of the Kuznets curve describes a lot of these countries. They, they have increased inequality as they've gotten wealthier. But I know that Brazil's middle class, South Africa's middle class, any number of countries, their middle classes have grown as inequality has increased. And so it just it's, there's a mismatch between our sociological concepts and our quantitative concepts of the Gini coefficient, it, it's, it has mathematical properties that, that give it a real limit on what it can say in terms of sociological, it's so, uh, the nature of the social structure in a, in a country, uh, and then that changes over, you can have the same Gini coefficient, have a slightly different social structure. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, just kind of rattling off ideas at this point, um, but I think that 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 the fact that the Gini coefficient has these particular properties, it can only be measured in certain ways, um, really does limit its use in terms of uh, understanding social structure and the nature of the social coalition, the political coalition that might impact the outcomes we care about in, in, in political science and certainly in economics as well when you start thinking about uh, the debates about whether inequality shapes redistribution or taxation, for example. So I also have a question about the empirical cases. So like, I wonder how you would explain or address like post-communist countries. Because a lot of countries on the communist era, there was huge collectivization of lands. Right. Like, you know, collectivization of farms under Stalin, collectivization of like rural well, lands under Bolshevism era. And then that means according to your prediction of your model, that those are the countries that will have like very stable transition to democracy, and also um, strong consolidation of democracy, which we don't really see empirically. So I wonder how well, you what would you, What countries are you thinking of in terms of where you don't see this empirically? Well, if, if you're talking about transition, China is, of course, the case. Because in terms of land equality, it's, it's a state <coughs> ownership. Mm -hmm. so we don't really but it hasn't transitioned to democracy, I mean. So. Right, but I mean, yeah, but your also empirical analysis has like democratization as a dependent variable. Sure. No, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I just got invited to go to Shanghai. And, and so, because they, they, they want to think about inequality in China. And, and I know nothing about China, but they want me to think about this precisely for that reason. So I have, I have a, a couple of answers. And one is to refer back, I think it was Barbara Geddes and also <sighs> Valley Bond, somebody else talking about the Leninist legacy in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And they, they said it's one of the ironic, this is before we wrote the book, right, but we cite them somewhere in, the, in our book, is one of the ironic positive consequences of collectivization is the elimination of the landed elites. The Junker class is gone. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a positive outcome for democracy in, in the region. It's not the only factor that's important, mm -hmm. um, but that is one of the Leninist legacies. Now, when you get into other cases, uh, that where this social structural transformation has mattered. Mm -hmm. I, I, and this was a question I got a long time ago from Steph Haggard, who's the expert on South Korea. Mm -hmm. He says, well, you can't explain South Korea because it never got really unequal in South Korea. He, he was focusing on income inequality. I started reading about South Korea and how they wiped out the land of the elite in response to the North Korean uh, decision to do the same in the 1950s. Same thing happened in Taiwan. And the same thing happened in revolutionary China. So, just finishing up, and you respond. If uh, our argument in the book suggests that China is far more likely to democratize today than it was 50 years ago, mm -hmm. but is it going to happen today? No. Is it going to happen tomorrow? Probably not. Maybe in the decades. I don't know. Maybe never. Mm -hmm. But it's, this is a probabilistic mm -hmm. argument, and one of the reasons would be because they eliminated the landed elites. Mm 
So I actually was about to comment on cases in East Asia as well. I mean, you're right that land reform, there was massive land reforms in Taiwan and South Korea during the colonialism and also right wing was the term regime, so there were no strong land elites. But democratization process in those countries were not led by economic elites. It was by labor movement. So I think that's also that's a good point. Um, and, and what we say in the book and uh, what I'd say in the I think we say this in the paper too is it's a kind of a question of a dog that doesn't bark. And and, and I think it's important to appreciate this in terms of the social science theory, which is if you have a force that's actively opposing democracy, you would always write about it. But if that disappears, and if there, there's no longer that social force opposing democracy, that's equally important for the theoretical story and for the outcome. And so you're right. Yeah, I don't think it was about landed elites or yeoman farmers in South Korea leading the, you know, fine. But it's equally important to explain the eventual democratization in South Korea and Taiwan. Um, Talk about whether labor unions are economic elites or not some other time. But, uh, well, they're, they're, they're wealthy relative to the median voter, but they're not elites, like chapel owners or whatever. But, anyway. I was just wondering if there's any evidence that the Taiwanese people are more mentioned at some point that it's minimalist. And you probably talked about this in your book, but I just sure. So we we uh, we try and slice and dice it multiple ways. So we start off using the Bosch Rosato uh, dichotomous measure, which is more or less the same as the Jaworski measure, but it's explicitly based on suffrage as opposed to just uh, party it, whether parties change uh, when they get a shift from one party to another, as, as in the Zhivorsky. So Bosch's is whether half the men have the vote or more. And most countries in the 20th century goes from nobody having the vote to everybody having the vote. And, and only in the 19th century, pre-World War I, do you see these gradation shifts. Um, so that, that, of course, leaves people unhappy because it's really <coughs> minimalist, right? And so then we have another chapter where we use polity. And, slice and dice that both on the 21 point scale and we look at uh, a trichotomous measure using polity like the Epstein O'Halloran paper and then we have I for, there's one other way that we do it using the polity as, and the results are all the same and so we just kind of say you know whatever you want to use you're going to get the same result because we've got two data sets on income inequality uh, two three data sets on Dependent variable. We sometimes, you know, you, you, you read it eventually. Sometimes we get fixed effects. Sometimes you don't. And uh, everything always runs the same direction. So more or less with the same number of stars on the on the numbers. So you know, you never get income inequality being you know a, a negatively correlated with democratization. It always comes up strangely, right? But good for us, positive. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about the amount of international trade in your story, because essentially my feeling would be that it's very different, uh, the same pattern of uh, ownership uh, on natural resources, but in a country that has a comparative advantage uh, in producing things that are intensive on those natural resources, like Argentina, Brazil, Chile, versus China, Korea, uh, which are countries that do not have a comparative advantage on Resources. So my feeling is that it's more complicated in those countries that have a comparative advantage on, on the things that are intensive in natural resources for, for, for political consequences. No? Uh, that's one thing. And then another thing is, um, if you thought about um, <coughs> differences in uh, distribution of the assets versus the uh, flows that you get from, uh, from those assets, no? because that could be different. So in Latin America, you have I don't think there was a huge restitution of, of land, for example, but during import substitution, we are heavily taxing uh, the floats that, that were coming from those assets, from land. No? So, and that has consequences for income distribution, and uh, maybe also have political consequences, no? Um, for, your, for your first question, um, all I can say is it, it, we paid no attention to it theoretically. I think in one model somewhere we throw in trade as GDP and it didn't have any effect. But 
that might not be very satisfactory to you. Um, what we did pay more attention to was um, capital stock as a potential confounder because there is the theoretical notion that um, economies that dominated by mobile capital will be more likely to democratize. The auto autocratic economies, um, because the elite will threaten to take their capital somewhere else, uh, and, and be because certain scholars have used this uh, capital stock variable as an indicator of inequality, which I thought was completely erroneous. And so we threw it in there, and it has no correlation. For, you know, we, we found that it had no correlation with regime change. I don't know whether it has any correlation with stability. Um, I don't remember if we had it in the models in the paper. But I am recalling that, that in terms of a capital stock variable, which is some, probably related to what you were talking about, again, had no effect. But I think you have to be careful with capital stock because I think what you mean by mobile is like if you can flow <laughs> the capital out of the country, so right. democracy will not tax you essentially. Right. Right. So the capital stock that is in the country is essentially, by definition, not measured in that part. Um, what we did was we took a. a this is this is just from the World Bank, you know. So they have a capital stock measure. Okay, right? And then you, we subtracted out the proportion of capital stock that comes from natural resources, i.e. the least mobile of all of whatever your capital stock is. So oil, uh, whatever they, however they count up the value of land itself, et cetera. And so it, it is more or less stuff that you could actually pick up and move or just transfer via wire, right? Um, and, and so that's just, we tried to control for whatever it is that would be problematic what you were, I think, and what you're thinking. Um, I'm not sure I understood the second question. Is it in terms of, I think what you're getting at is there's an endogenous, there's a potential end, endogenous yeah. factor here. A smart dictator would, would tax certain assets over other assets to keep his coalition secure, right? Well, I mean, essentially, it's, you can do some kind of, some kind of land reform, essentially. Right. Like wipe out all the, all the, all the elites heavily invested in natural resources. Or, well, that will produce a huge uh, difference, change, uh, change in, the, in the distribution of, of assets, right. and then by definition also in the flows that are coming about, about from those assets. No? The other option is that period by period, you can start like, I don't know, taxing the exports or taxing the flows of those assets and start redistributing those things. Uh, those things are kind of more transitory from my point of view than a complete uh, redistribution of assets, no? Possible. I and mean, I think it is interesting historically that land reforms actually happen more often in dictatorships than in democracies, which is counterintuitive for these redistributivist logics. Um, but the, the, the real question is, why would, how, how does a dictator be so, I think he's so safe that he can essentially cut off one of the social groups that supports the regime uh, and engage in this land reform. Uh, and that's a really interesting and puzzling historical question um, because it, 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 is, it would be problematic for our, for our argument. Um, in terms of the taxation, though, I, this is one of those questions where I, I would say, look, you and I need to sit down for a, an afternoon and, and, and think about this, and then by the end of it, we'll, we'll have a paper. I think would focus on something like 1880 to 1930, when, when import and export taxes were, were still really important and income duties had income tax hadn't become really important. You know, one of the things, another aspect we didn't include in the book, we have some data. Uh, so so what, when we wrote the book, we, we, we wrote Peter Linder, and he sent us all of his data on social welfare spending. He was really gracious about it. And we, we had an RA gather social welfare spending and taxing for the rest of the world, because he, he did 30 countries. And we have this chapter about spending in the book, but we never did anything about taxes. And what you see is that, that yeah, based on social structure, the, the, the types of taxes, that there, there is a historical evolution of tax structures around the world, but it varies. And I don't think there's a lot of research on this uh, that, that really gets at the politics of this shift away from export and import duties to income and uh, wealth tax, uh, uh, inheritance taxation in the 20th century um, because the data are so bad at some levels. You know, what are the origins of social welfare spending? You have to look at the flip side. 
what are the origins of taxation. So um, maybe we should write a paper. Let me follow up on Gustavo's, because it, it also gets back at the, the other question about rule of law. And you mentioned it in your paper. What, what people are afraid of, essentially, is expropriation. But there's lots of, of margins. In Argentina, what they did was they held down the price of wheat in the Pampas, and then they sold it at the world price, and Perón took that, and, you know, and so did Fernandez, and that's been going on forever. Um, but in, in other cases, like Bob Bates is well documented, um, where agriculture sector is actually more important, it tends to be more, much more heavily taxed and redistributed. Uh, and it's subsidized in rich countries like the US and OECD. Um, but, but I would argue your, 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 the intuition here, what comes to mind is people are worried about taxes. But what they're deriving their wealth from, these rural guys, is control of labor. Right. right. Control of labor mobility, uh, control, totally you know, indentures, uh, you know, debt peonage in the Yucatan. So, so the mechanisms on plantation agriculture by which you, uh, and I just read a paper by Dan Treffler and Abner Greif and so on, they were all about this notion of taxation stuff. And they just, they missed the point that it was all about controlling labor in the Caribbean. So I think you might want to put that in there, that, that, that the source of their wealth is, isn't the land. It's controlling no, we, labor and labor mobility. And I don't think that, it at least it didn't paper. come out in, in the it, paper. We have a, a, a line or two in the book where we say, um, and I got this from the Royce Meyer Stevens and Stevens book. And they say they got it from Moore. But what's interesting is the way in which the Melton Richard logic has really infested the study right. of these relations in, in the countryside as well. But Moore's not talking about the median peasant expropriating the, the Lord's land, right? Neither are Royce Meyer Stevens and Stevens to make the point that it's about control over mobility and control right. over wages. That was the political interest of landowners. And then they shift and focus totally on, on urban labor, right? But we say that's also what we, we I think, theoretically are required to say. We're not uh, required in the sense that it, it makes, it only, our argument only makes sense if we say uh, our theoretical concern is not about whether the uh, median rural worker is going to expropriate land. It's about this control of the elite's concern about control over the mobility exactly. and wages of the elite yeah. voter. Otherwise, our argument is basically the same as Ahim William Robinson or Bosch or others right. for the rural sector. It's just different for income inequality. So I totally agree with you about that. Maybe we just need to be more explicit. At least I, I didn't. It's uh, not in the paper. It's yeah. in the book. And I think it's, it's important because I, I walked away from this with a different sense. Of, of what okay. these guys would be afraid of, and I think it's it's control over labor. That's, uh, that's good for me to, to note. That, uh, I get this often, so I gotta go back to this. Who's a couple? Who's Jess and Lauren? And, yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so I wanted to uh, ask sort of a couple of related questions. One, if you could clarify, um, I think we have a sort of common collective understanding as to who constitutes the elite. But because sort of groups seem to be moving in and out of that category, according to your story, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe you can clarify a little bit more, in part because it seems so linked to the extent to which, I mean, you know, this wonderful sentence about democracy survives when rising economic groups and new wealth improves their ability to successfully negotiate a balanced distribution of tax burden across all relatively wealthy groups. <coughs> I'm sort of wondering, you know, constant thought across history or not, who, who remains which then leads me to a broader question of how you see this particular work sort of fitting in or diverging from or sort of clarifying one aspect of how we're trying to do it. And then finally, just I think um, this conversation about rule of law is fascinating. I feel like there's this wonderful opportunity to endogenize property rights, um, particularly, I, it sounded like maybe you're heading towards a formal model. Um, in but, this paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, sorry. So. Um, so one way would be to sort of think about the extent to which you get democracy with strong certain kinds of property rights versus others, um, based on sort of who is particularly worried about or um, thinks that they will benefit most from being in, from having democracy versus not. 
the idea that it would allow you to sort of get, I mean, yeah. you know, this wonderful sort of empirical regularity of property rights and democracy go together, but it seems like there's a wonderful opportunity to, there to sort of unpack why that might be the case, given your theory. I think I'm going to say for your third question, yes, I agree with you. Um, I don't have to think about that, and uh, I'll get back to you. Um, the first question, who are the elites? Yeah, this is in the book, and so you know, if you're not familiar with the book, uh, that's okay, um, because we do have a pretty, uh, and it goes back to your question, we have a, a, a for, for some folks who are coming out of the political science tradition, they like Royce Meyer Stevens and Stevens, um, labor is not an elite. Uh, it's only the landowners and the industrial bourgeoisie. We say, no, that's, that's not right. If you take a Melter and Richard approach, and what you're looking at is the poorest guy to the richest guy, median voter in almost every developing country in the world is really poor, and typically working in the rural sector. Um, and so the case study we have in the book is, let's look at the, the, most, the, the country with the historically largest working class, urban working class in history, the 19th century uh, Victorian in England, right? Where did the organized urban working class fall on this scale that we can put from zero to 100? Guess what? 85th, 90th percentile. Now, that, that, that doesn't mean that they're rich, right? But they're rich compared to some guy dragging his feet in the muck in that Monty Python movie, right? <laughs> um, and especially, it's, it, when, if you're reading Royce Meyer Stevens, Stevens and work in that ilk, it's organized labor who are, and there's this huge debate, it's, it's uh, uh, among British historians about the uh, elite of the working class versus the non-elite. And why, and Marx is writing about this too at the time, why is the laboring man so unwilling to vote his interests? The same arguments we're having today, right? They're not organized, most of them. And the... Uh, London working men's unions had a very snooty attitude towards those workers be below them. They didn't want them to be part of it. So it's really interesting. We, it, it, the history is really interesting, but the answer to your question is organized labor is a relative elite. And when you look at the redistributive consequences of democratization, and this is very much in line with uh, Elizabeth and Persico papers in economics, uh, Gra uh, Justin Gradstein, and uh, what's his name? Uh, and a couple of other papers, I'll have to look them up, that, that show uh, that democracy is not, uh, Michael Ross's work in political science, democracy doesn't always work out so well for the poor in terms of redistribution. And so that's where we use the Peter, Peter Lindert's data to show, uh, because what's great about the data is, is that it differentiates types of, of social welfare spending from more to less redistributive in, going back to 1880. And so you can look at the level of inequality and the level of democracy and all these other variables on these different, the, the, the amount of the types of social welfare spending. And guess what? As inequality increases and as you democratize, you spend less on the poor, which is precisely the opposite of what the Meltzer Richard model would predict. You spend more on stuff that the working class and above want, which is pensions, uh, public education, infrastructures, roads. <coughs> Telecommunicate well, communications, the telegraphs at those times, railroads, um, and so that 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 last chapter in the next to last chapter in the book is kind of an extension of the logic um, that that justifies treating the elite as a rather broad category, so but it also varies. About sort of thinking about what where your work sits in the, right. the notion of that, that's, that's, I want to say one more thing about that question though is because you asked me about varying, and it goes back to your question about the Gini coefficient is. Now, the British working class is, is probably in the 85th percentile, but just, yeah, someone was asking me, who asked about Chile? Right? Well, the Chilean working class, historically in the same period, and there's this great book on the failed revolutions in Chile, was probably in the 95th percentile. That's one of the reasons it failed, is because it was so small, right? So this, this is, it, it varies you know, historically who, what percentile counts as elite, which is you know, getting back to your question about whether the, the genie or, or even these percentiles really tell us a lot about the social structure or not. But then, you know, in terms of modernization theory, um, we ultimately come down and say that, yeah, this is a modernization story. It's just not the um, kind of really stripped down, simplified version that Javorsky takes from Lipset. Now, modernization theory is going in two directions from Lipset. One is <coughs> per capita income explains <coughs> political outcomes, growth. 
The other is the kind of Englehart notion is it's all in your head, and, and that matters a lot. Well, let's just leave that aside for the moment. Um, but uh, Lipset's essentially trying to channel Marx, right? And um, was Marx talking about per capita income? I don't really know if he had that concept in his head. Is he talking about inequality? I would actually say probably more about inequality as part of the process of modernization. He didn't. He was not, not explicit about inequality, just like he wasn't explicit about per capita income, right? Uh, Lipset actually talks about inequality, but because it's 65 years ago, he didn't have any data, and so he just moves on. Um, Javorsky in channeling Lipset says the data still sucks, so I'm not going to pay any attention to inequality. Um, but I think that when you uh, when you when you take all of this together, um, I do think that the story about the uh, political consequences of economic growth and development. Uh, have to take into consideration both the size of the pie as well as how it's distributed. And so when you take that into consideration, it is a rereading, a revisioning, whatever, of modernization theory that brings into the story uh, of Moore, which is Moore's explicitly not modernization theory because he's talking to Lipset, right? And so he says it's not growth, not growth, right? But he's talking about different paths to modernization. Well, yeah, okay, if you have a strong rural sector, they're going to be politically powerful as the country grows wealthier. If you don't, you're going to get a per perhaps a different outcome. But it's still a story about how countries shift from pre-industrial to industrial and what the political consequences of that are. And that's, that's our story is simply some countries become more unequal as they develop. Some don't. But if they are, they're going to have a, a different political, more likely to follow a political path than those that don't. You know, it's not that the Kuznets curve or the front end is inevitable. A lot of countries do follow that path they're likely to take a political path that differs from the ones that don't follow that front end of the Kuznets curve. So we're good in the queue. Lauren, Ken, Claudia. Hi. Hey. So uh, I want to push you on what's not in the book. We all need to go out and definitely read it. Two cups. Um, but on, the, on the, the second part of the argument, inequality and the persistence of democracy, where the democracies persist, they don't collapse necessarily with this rise of inequality. And I want to, you know, this is the workshop on political theory and policy analysis, so I want to think about the normative implications of your argument and the policy implications of your argument, precisely because there are a lot of economists out there right now that are saying there's increasing in income inequality, pick a new site, but yeah. side lists, his chapter is Democracy in Peril. Which, right? which book is this, sorry? Um, uh, Joseph Stiglitz? Stiglitz. Stiglitz, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been on this for a weird, for a right. while, yeah. Right, right. And so, and he's connecting it to globalization and other issues, but, um, and because, you know, listening to, with the Iowa caucus a few weeks, a few days away, yeah. um, Bernie Sanders is on this, and, and thinking about what are Trump, the yeah, policy yeah. implications <laughs> of what you're seeing. And then thinking about um, the minimalist definition of democracy, and if you see it in one of the most unequal societies on earth, in South Africa, you know, is that the persistence of democracy? Um, yeah. Looking at the service delivery riots, looking at the students in arms, the police brutality at Marikana, um, and then looking at Ferguson here in Baltimore, and and so how? So the last piece of my question is how does we don't hear you talking about race or ethnicity or other kinds of ways, other identities that we intersect with sure. the mm -hmm. Never mind gender. With the, you know, okay, I'll, I'll bring down. Ignore gender. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren said I could. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, this goes back to the question earlier about well, how do you define democracy? And what did we leave out of the book? It clearly left out of the book and out of this article the quality of democracy. Um, so in defining democracy minimal as uh, the persistence of elections under universal suffrage, we leave a lot out, and we acknowledge that. And in the book, maybe uh, there's in the conclusion a couple pages, it's not at all here, maybe there's a paragraph in the end about, well, what, is, what does this leave out? And I, I think we're, actually I don't remember, we're pretty explicit in the book yeah, sorry, in this in this article at the end where we say something about 
uh, how discomforting this result might be, but at least you can set a scope on the potential impact of these different forms of inequality. So we can say, you know, income inequality, no matter how high it gets, is not really obviously related to the collapse of that system of choosing leaders. End of discussion. However, maybe it is related to some of these other outcomes you were discussing. Uh, and so, yeah, I would point to Piketty or Stiglitz's book and say, uh, what is the evidence now on the quality of democracy? Um, why is it that um, many Americans believe inequality has no relationship to the quality of democracy, and so many believe the opposite? Um, does, does this result really suggest that this, you know, could get us? Uh, you, you were asking me about these uh, economic debates when we started off, and we should put something to rest. What did you teach in your core comparative politics seminars? Spend a week on defining democracy, and then you throw up your hands and go, I wish we would just move on from this debate, right? Well, sorry, you know, we're, we're right back where we started, which is, well, we, we know that, that these social structures, puzzlingly, don't seem to have much of an effect. Well, rural inequality does, but it doesn't matter so much in most countries around the world. Historically, it mattered a lot more. Um, but if income inequality continues to go up and we keep saying we're a democracy, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm kind of torn. You know, On the one hand, I, I'm, I'm with, uh, uh, on, on the one hand, it, it, it's pretty obvious that wealth translates to influence, right? Um, but on the other hand, when I read my own book and I say, you know, even in these equal countries, they're, they're not spending a lot of money on poor. You know, it's it's not like it's Britain, you know, roses for people. You know, where where it's equal, equality. What what matters? There are other things that matter uh, in terms of getting to Denmark. If you're a fan of Bernie Sanders, right? Being small, uh, being next to other wealthy countries. You know, oh, et cetera, et cetera. What? They're all happy. They're all happy. Where, yeah. Um, et cetera. Um, it's not about the median voter. It's not about. Uh, uh, it has it. social homogeneity that matters a lot. So I'm I'm, I'm into these uh, these uh, social psychological theories of redistribution these days. Reading a lot about that and seeing people do experiments on this and some of the results. Right, but your definition to... of democracy kind of like cuts through precisely those like nuances that makes democracy what matters. I, I don't think that most Americans, for that matter, most people in developing countries are really concerned that what is going to happen if inequality raises, um, the democracy is going to collapse in the form of, you know, like the, 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 the set of social, the set of political institutions that we call democracy, right. by which you mean um, multi-party uh, free and fair elections. Mm -hmm. So I, it's just, it seems to me that the, to some extent, the definition is, is circular. Like we are trying to get at a definition of inequality that's profoundly normative, right. but at the same time we define democracy in its barest, possible way. I'm, I'm with uh, Javorsky and Ian Shapiro on this one in, in, in their take on Roberto Bobbio's definition of democracy is the uh, best system, no, no political system eliminates coercion, democracy reduces coercion. Right. And so we should support democracy. It's also vague. Um, but there is a nor there is He's a political theorist, though. <laughs> but there's, my point is to say there is normative content to a minimalist definition. Is again back to these debates we have in our opening sem seminars and comparative politics and debates about whether it's it, it takes too much of a normative out of a definition of democracy, because you know as all the political scientists in the room will tell you, when you start packing this stuff in, you don't know how to define the regime anymore. Right? You you don't have a, a way of defining the regime. It's a limit. There's, there's no limit to where you should end in terms of uh, defining. Should it be participatory? Should it be deliberative? Should it have, be based on outcomes of a certain kind? You know, I'm actually with Jaworski on, on the usefulness for research questions of a minimalist definition, while acknowledging what Lauren was saying. It's like that leaves so much out. But I say, yeah, and that's that's a task that, that I'm explicitly not trying. I'm not trying to tackle that here. But, uh, and, and I don't know whether either a Melter Richard or an elite competition approach would help us answer those questions. Because as research on democratization show, I, I actually believe, Adam Jaworski has this 
horribly discomforting paper if you're a, a, a fan of theories of social mobilization, which shows that the title is something like, was it granted or was it uh, taken? And it's about female suffrage. And he essentially says, it was granted. That all that mobilization, eh, it was inevitable. I mean, so it's really kind of a discomforting argument if, you're, if you believe in the power of mobilization, right? But he's got this you know, really long-term historical analysis that, that tries to refute this notion. So, you know, big questions there. I don't have an answer. I guess I have a career's worth of research left to do. That. Absolutely. <laughs> oh boy. So Ken, Claudia, yeah. Bernardo, Charlie. So having gotten a lot of the serious questions out of the way, I want to ask a really <laughs> stupid one. Uh, and and it and it it goes to the the way you frame the questions here, which is, uh, as I see it, it um, uh, this is about who's going to have the power, and how does how does that power shape the, the, the choice of government. And um, in, in one of the directions we've taken, the, the primary direction we've taken at the workshop is to start asking questions about governance broadly mm -hmm. and governance in a number of different settings. And can we find sort of meta themes uh, that would explain governance in different settings? So you're looking at national governance. Um, unencumbered as I am with any understanding of political science, when I read this, I immediately jumped to organizational theory. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I was reminded your your conclusion, uh, and it, it, it wasn't a sharp connection, but it, a, a, a very quick connection to Hansman's ownership of enterprise, where he asks a really interesting question, which is, why does money own enterprise? <coughs> and, the, and the bottom line is, you know, you could have labor on enterprise, you have suppliers, you could have buyers owning enterprise, but money owns enterprise. And the reason is because money is uniform. That is, money only wants one thing, more money. And it, and because it's uniform, it's a lot easier to make quick decisions. <coughs> and so that form of government makes sense, or governance makes sense for most organizations, not all. And, and I was struck by the similarity in outcome to yours, which is sort of, well, we, we get democracy when we when, when we have less conflict within the elite. You know, the, the, as you just said, the elite are the ones with influence, the ones who have resources have influence. And I'm wondering if maybe rather than a power argument, we could make an efficiency argument for form of government, which says, and, and this is where my argument falls apart, uh, but it would say something like, the reason autocracy emerges uh, or, or uh, is more stable Persists. when when you have land and capital and you've got uneven distributions of land is because land needs different considerations than other forms of wealth. It takes it has different interests and it's harder to manage diversity of interests. If land is a very big deal, you've got to make all kinds of special accommodation to get the most out of that land. And who's more nimble, democracy or autocracy? Autocracy is going to be more nimble, therefore it gets more out of the land than democracy. Now I realize it's a very tenuous argument, but I, I was struck by that connection. I thought makes a lot of sense. Wouldn't it be interesting? Um, you're being generous. But no, no. I, I, I'll tell you what. What I want to do next actually is um, and again. I was talking to Ar Armando left. So what I, what I want to do next is precisely along these lines, which is um, so so uh, Barrington Moore's book uh, on social origins of democracy and dictatorship is 50 years old now, uh, and, and uh, it's mainly about medieval and, and, and the emergence of modern uh, industrial societies and the decline of uh, traditional rural societies, i.e. what he calls the commercialization of agriculture. And, and he, he, part of the point he makes is, is that the interests of rural elites did change over time, and yet the Prussian Junkers or whatever still maintained this anti-democratic attitude because of these needs to control labor need to control wages and labor mobility. Uh, and what I think is missing, and, and it's great, we have some economists here, maybe you can shoot me an email or, or tell me. Um, in political science, I don't know of any research that has looked at the consequences of a demographic uh, evacuation of the countryside, as well as the dramatic technological transformation of agriculture over the last 50 years around the world. You know, I mean, I, I've been in Brazil and seen this personally, 
um, we live in rural areas, we see this around us, you know, Minnesota and Indiana, and yet what do we, we know there are uh, uh, agrarian interest groups out there, yet we don't know, I think, we don't know a lot how this has changed over time. Um, I can just start with the big question for me is, well, if most, not all, but most rural elites initially opposed democratization historically, a lot of them seem to have accommodated themselves pretty well to it. Yeah. Um, how and why did that happen? Uh, and a lot of it has to do with they don't care about labor anymore. They really don't. It's all mechanized and or, you know, they, they have their interest groups in, in, in Washington or Brasilia or wherever, to, to, but, but they don't need to physically be there and have that cultural uh, status as the big man in, in the community owning the land. Uh, so it's not just about the, the three pennies on a dollar. It, it's also about, about there's a cultural change also that is part of the story. Um, but I, I think there's a, a lot of interesting questions that, 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 are, that are related to precisely what you're talking about in terms of, what, what did you say, land needs other considerations relative to other forms of wealth. I wonder how much that was true 100 years ago versus today. I think it's actually that, that, that uh, if you talk to people at Cargill or ADM, they, they don't care whether it's a piece of land or, or a car, an auto manufacturing plant. To them, it's, it's yeah. very similar issues. For, uh, I'm exaggerating. But it, it, it depends on the economy. I, I've been doing a lot of work with the, the palm oil industry. They're very dependent yeah, on still. labor, and it's really important so, that they yeah. uh, have certain considerations extended to them. Sort of sugar cane or coffee picking banana, you know, they're, depending on the commodity, right? But for, uh, you know, back to Gustavo's question is how much value added is there in, in, in well, in palm oil, maybe a lot in Indonesia, for example, but, but in Brazil uh, and Argentina, it's all soybeans all the time now or chicken parts. Um, apart from minerals and other exports, but in the agricultural sector, it, it's uh, much less labor-intensive crops that are adding value added to its trade balance. So, you know, that, that's a, there's an interesting story there somehow. That you know, I don't know enough about agriculture and agricultural politics or economics, but I think a few, one a few years. Story of soya bean is everything technological change. Yeah, it's everything technological change. Yeah. They started with nothing. No, the western part of Brazil was scrub forest 25 years ago, and now it looks like Indiana or Iowa, right? So, except they got three harvests a year, right? So, it's uh, a lot of it gained a lot. And what are the political consequences of that? Is is a I think an untold story. We have a paper. Oh, well, then send it to me. Uh, yeah. Claudia, let's collect some questions. So, Claudia, Bernardo, Kirk, Cherry's in there. Let's collect these and then have you okay. sum up. So, David, thanks yes. for coming. I really like your argument because I am Latin Americanist and I am a strong believer about the impact of inequality and stability in general of all the institutions. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering whether you have considered other contingencies, not just the impact about inequality per se and this stability, but this is contingent and having other channels of participation, for example, and this is your thinking in the case of Latin America. Well, they might be, they might have this inequality, but people might be happy because they have other channels by which they can't express their discontent. For example, yeah, yeah. having a decentralization, political decentralization. We all know that actually it was a strategy <coughs> that was adopted in order to pacify this content and to say, have this little participation at the national level while we can continue gathering all this wealth. Yes? So I was wondering whether it could be contingent and having other channels of participation through decentralization, even through electoral rules. So maybe by having a proportional representation with the open uh, list, Maybe that favors them and they pacify all these people. Maybe also about what Gustavo was mentioning, other people, the nature of the uh, main uh, sector in the production. So I wonder whether you have thought about these contingencies. So we're going to take the questions. Yeah, let's take some. Okay. Yeah, Bernardo. Okay. Uh, uh this literature, this Meltzer and Richard literature in economics, the, the place it went to was that in, in mid-90s, it was, it was proved wrong econometrically. 
about in '95. He proved it about, and, and it's not it's not set in terms of if you go to democracy or autocracy. What what the economics literature goes is what social contract you go sure. to, what combination of redistribution and inequality you choose. And then the the seminal paper in this is is uh, Benabu 2000 where he gets this pin, uh, Peter Linder uh, um, idea that, cont contrary to what economists always thought, that redistribution does not distort. On the contrary, it, it, in, it increases wealth and, and, and growth. Mm -hmm. And when you have that, then that changes everything. And he's, he's able to get this, this U-shaped relationship between uh, support for redistribution and, and, and inequality, where you can get multiple equilibrium. You get, mm -hmm. So the same country, can either have a Scandinavian type of social contract with a lot of redistribution and, and, and low inequality, or a U.S. social contract. So really where more Minnesota versus Arkansas or something. Yeah. <laughs> In the U.S. No, I, uh, so I can just respond to you very quickly. Is uh, tell it to Ajmolian and Robinson. Why, why is it that Ajmolian and Robinson are using this not just to talk about redistribution in the 2000s, but then based their whole book on that on that model? Uh, I, I, I tell people I, I think it's interesting that we, we're talking to both economists and political science, anyone, and sociologists as, as well. I, I don't believe the Meltzer Richards model either, um, but it's still it's so seductive to so many people. It's still, when you look at that, find it on Google Scholar that one paper has 15,000 citations that continues to get several hundred a year. Um, why? I think we have this attraction for uh, theories that explain a lot with one moving part, right? You know, ours has three moving parts, so hopefully we'll get a few hundred citations. <laughs> but because it's so much more complicated, you know, oh, no, elite competition. I'm, I'm making a joke out of it, but, but it, it is frustrating to me also to see that, I mean, I've read the Benabou papers, the Benabou and Auto papers, you know, those are, you know, there, there are all sorts of empirical tests as well, and so... But yet, Bosch in political science, Ajmol and Robinson, same thing. It's like, well, let's build this theory of regime change on this theory of distribution that has such flimsy theoretical and empirical support. Um, and I started out this project um, just kind of criticizing that literature, came to the theory, you know, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't like this deductive light went off first and then everything flowed from, I did it a little backwards, but. No, it's it. I, I'm I'm like that. It's at the Austro workshop because the inspiration is is, is this North and Wine gas, but there really is a confluence here. With these ideas about property rights and governance. It, it's, but it is cast. This goes to your Claudia's question. Uh, um, the answer is essentially no. Um, to be honest, um, because we wanted to keep this as a very macro view. You know, it's it's. We're not a, it's a telescope, not a microscope, or as I, depending on if I'm in the U.S. or outside of the U.S., when I talk of, when I'm presenting this, I say it's a mile-wide, inch-deep, or <laughs> kilometer-wide, centimeter-deep project. <laughs> um, and I think there's room for projects like that, um, but it does lose a lot. You know, you lose all the details, and um, all the cases we know, we may say, well, this didn't, you know, South Korea doesn't fit, or this doesn't fit, or whatever. Yeah, okay, but we're, we're trying to explain these broad patterns. Jerry and Kirk and Rebecca. Hi, um, I'm Barb. Um, no, Jerry's the last name. Yes, right. um, so um, the question I had was, to what extent have you thought about integrating into your analysis the fact that starting in, let's say, the mid 19th century, but accelerating through now, the fact that we had the rise of another governance form called the corporation? And through the corporation, you have new forms of elites. It affects what you might define what an elite is. It might define new forms of inequality. And also, particularly in the United States, they've been able to take on certain roles as a political actor, which complicates further the connection between the economic wealth inequality and um, how our democracy functions. So you're starting to get into quality aspects. And so that's a whole other dimension and a way of aggregating wealth that, to me, is part of modernizing, going from just thinking in terms of land. Yeah. And then how the corp form itself has even affected the agriculture, you no. know, yes. and all these kinds of things. So I didn't know if you would take into account this whole, no, there's a whole other layer you're talking in about there. corporations as legal persons? In yes. Sense? Yeah, no, we didn't. Uh, so that's, that's another an question. Yeah, piece really of the puzzle I just yeah. offered to think about. I have to... 
check that out somehow. There's another element to that, which is how do you define land ownership? Right. In Indonesia, much of the land, massive quantities of land are being transferred to corporations. So do the elite own the corporation? Are they accounted as owning that land, which essentially they do? Uh, but it's actually the corporation that owns the land. How does that work out in your statistics? The U.S. same thing. <clears throat> Almost all these farms are S corps. So close. Yes. I can ask it just after this if that's helpful. So you you get to sum up. And... Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sum up. I mean, no, I really think this is. I don't. I don't have to sum up. I mean, this is. You, you flip the the presentation. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great because I'm. I'm gonna take these on the airplane and stare at them for a while and think like, oh, you know, uh, I need to email you or you need to put me in touch with her and ask that question again. Um, you know, I, so I'm doing this session afterwards on, on editing and, and I edit a journal and I think my major problem right now is I'm gonna leave here with all these really interesting questions and you know, you mentioned this book on, what was this, Enterprise? And, Ownership of enterprise. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I gotta read that. And you probably have some book in mind, and you should email me. And I have no time to read. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's not even just a, it's it's an ongoing a whole term literature, of right? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh man, caffeine. Yeah, caffeine helps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all.